So if you've just joined us, um, this is the data collection and inter interpretation webinar. Uh, and we're talking about uh, how you can collect data in your classroom and how you can then go into interpret it. Uh, and at the moment, we're doing a little survey uh, about uh, you and your classroom and what you think about digital technologies. There's also an interesting question at the end you might have noticed if you got to the end of the survey. Uh, just thought we'd have a little bit of fun. Um, yeah. Any, I'm not able to get in. It's telling me I don't have permission to view the form. Oh, no. Well, thank you for... Yep, I'm the same. I've accidentally not clicked a button that I needed to click. Uh, all right. If you just refresh it, it should work now. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, that's got it. Thank yep. you. So that's one of the key parts of the curriculum is yeah. privacy and security, making sure that you're not too private. I get statewide block on mine. Uh, so you're not able to access Microsoft Forms? No, we can't do that up here. Uh, no. Not in the dark ages of Queensland, no. Uh, I thought Queensland was able to access Microsoft. Perhaps. Am I wrong on that? Not in the state schools, I don't think. Oh, no. I thought it was Google products. Is it you, have to, you have to be inside the um, Queensland state oh, no. group. Okay. I guess that's the other thing. All right. So, unfortunately, you won't be able to uh, uh, try out this, uh, this demo. Um, out of curiosity, when you're doing this sort of things, um, what products do you use for surveys and things? Forms. Forms? Okay. Yeah. So you, you, because you can access it inside of your school, it's never an issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in a... I'm in a private school in Queensland. Okay. That I have okay. colleagues and friends who, who work in, in the um, in the incredible lockdown vault that is Queensland education. Yep. Um, Elisa's saying Survey Monkey. Does that work um, from the outside, Jenna? Yeah, I can use Survey Monkey. Hmm. Okay. Is, is there limits on that, or do you have some sort of education uh, license? I don't know. It's the only survey monkeys that have come up. I haven't had any problems with. Okay. Yeah, I think there's limits on the number of questions or the number of responses, I think, for free. At least saying that you get um, yeah. free questions. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, this survey would have fit in there. <laughs> All right, looks like we've got one response so far. So props to Liam, who's managed to finish first. Oh, we've got six responses now. They're all right on the money. So out of curiosity, we had a question there that was, when did you last eat a donut? Uh, did anyone have real troubles remembering when they last ate a donut? Yes. No. Uh, long time. <laughs> I guess if you last ate a donut like 10 minutes ago, it probably made things really easy. It was my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a donut cake? Is that, is that what happened? No, no, I couldn't have a whole cake. It'd be a bit too much. No, <laughs> 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 uh, Daniel, may I ask you about the the, the, the the course you mentioned at the university? Um, yes. Um, is, is that master's or it's just... Uh... Yeah, it's a master's of education, but there is the option to do it as a grad certificate or a, um, a graduate diploma. Um, and would that be online or would that be accessible for the students across Australia? I'm, not, I'm new still to Australia, so I'm thinking how it's yeah, going to work. Yeah, it's a completely online degree. So it's through the University of Sydney, but you can complete it um, uh, completely online, yeah. Um, the best way, if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to answer them um, probably at a different time to the webinar, but um, I'll pop my email in the chat 
And if you if that's okay, yep. yeah, if that's okay, we can open send yep. any questions through um, about it. Uh, and I'll just link a a page that has a bit more information about it as well. Too. That'll be amazing. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, so if you're still going with the survey, um, keep going, but we're going to move on a little bit and talk about uh, what it means to do data collection and interpretation. Uh, all right, so that was the survey. Um, do you want to talk about this, Dan? Yep. So um, you may uh, already be uh, familiar with the um, different sequences of content for the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies. Um, this is a really good um, view of basically um, all the content descriptions um, across all the different bands. Um, and what we're doing today is we're focusing on um, one particular area, which is uh, collecting, managing, um, and analyzing data. So um, as you can sort of see, as we move um, up towards, uh, up through the bands, we gradually um, learn about more sort of complex data analysis and, and collection uh, methods. So if you haven't seen that before, and, and I guess one thing to, to note there is that um, that's the Australian curriculum and then within the different states um, that may um, be slightly different. Um, but basically to, to get to that, we have, um, you go to the Australian curriculum site and to uh, the technologies uh, learning area, and you can find uh, that basically those sequences of scopes um, um, through the PDF documents link there. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to say there. Um, so a few people have said that they've been to uh, some of the other uh, ACA webinars, um, and you've probably seen uh, this resource if you've come along to those, but if you haven't, um, there's a resource from the Australian Computing Academy, um, which has been worked on by the uh, Australian Curriculum Writers for Digital Technologies. Um, where basically they go through and expand on um, the expectations in the curriculum. So um, it's a really useful resource. Um, we really recommend um, that you have a look. It breaks every you'll notice are on the posters behind both me and Kenny. Um, so we have these uh, posters up with the, with the different uh, key concept icons. And today we're focusing on two of those key concepts in the curriculum, data collection and uh, data interpretation. So um, within this table, we then have the content descriptions that are relevant. Um, and you'll notice that um, you know, up until um, uh, seven and eight, there, um, but uh, as we get into uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, then uh, they become con like separate content descriptions for data collection and, and analysis and uh, interpretation. Um, so something to these concepts are, uh, there's data collection and, and data interpretation and um, there's some brief descriptions of what those uh, concepts mean and, and the differences between them. So when we're talking about collection, we're talking about collecting, storing um, and acquiring data. When we're talking about data interpretation, it's about how we get meaning from the data that we've collected or acquired um, and interpreting it, analyzing it, and also uh, visualizing it as well. So you'll notice those two uh, different icons. Sorry, Kenny. Um, uh, those different icons, they sort of um, separate. You know, those are the, the two different concepts there. So I'll hand back over to Kenny. Uh, so now we're going to talk a bit more about the specifics of data. So this is from the Australian uh, curriculum uh, structure page, um, which gives a bit of a, more of a uh, definition about data collection. And this is also on the Australian, uh, the ACA curriculum page as well, where we go through each of the key concepts. Um, so it says data collection is the numerical, categorical and textual facts measured, collected, or calculated as the basis for creating information in digital systems. So the key thing is that it's not just a series of um, random unrelated facts, um, but it's facts collected for creating information together. Um, so uh, what does it mean to do data collection inside of your schools? Um, so you've all probably heard of this before, and certainly if you're um, teaching science or mathematics, um, 
you've done a bit of these activities. So in the early eight years, um, it doesn't have to be with using a computer. You can do paper-based tallying. So if you've ever done that activity where you go out to the front of the school and you tally how many different cars of different colors come past, or you have a packet of uh, M&Ms and you count how many M&Ms there are of each different color. Um, that's an example of data collection. Um, you can also use software though, like you can use spreadsheets, so you can use Microsoft Excel or whatever um, software you happen to, to have on your iPads or your uh, uh, school computers or whatever. You can use survey software, like we use Microsoft Forms then, or you can use Google Forms or whatever it may be. Um, uh, I've got a question for all of you, which is, uh, what software have you used for teaching data collection in your classroom? Um, you can say it in the chat or Pop on your microphone if you like. I use forms. Uh, with older forms, with older kids, I also expose them to work, uh, to to um, Microsoft Excel <laughs> spreadsheets. Yep. yep. And creating graphs there with that's how they. Yeah, we've got lots of people in the chat saying similar things, forms, SurveyMonkeys, uh, Excel. Uh, someone saying that they transfer things into Access after doing Excel. Um, yeah, these are all uh, good examples of um, different tools to do for data collection. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot out there as well. Uh, all right. Uh, and I've got a question for younger students because the that's something I struggle with to find a good tool for the younger students to represent it with the iPads. Have you came across of something for the younger early year students? Yeah, so there's an activity uh, that's in, I think, our Scratch webinar about using Scratch to um, collect survey data. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so that's a, an interesting thing that you can do. It's a little bit more custom than anything else, but uh, it's an interesting way to, to collect that data using tools that they already know. Um, all right, the other thing we can do is we can use um, sensors to collect data. So it's a different kind of data than necessarily you'd collect in a survey. Um, but here we've got an example uh, resource with from MakeCode, which is about using uh, the micro bits to collect data from a smart garden. So, you know, getting your micro bit with its, um, uh, with its buttons and with its, uh, you, like, you can connect a, a soil, uh, What's the word? I can't think of the word. Soil hydration. You can test out how, how wet the soil is and you can test the light well, moisture, that sort of thing. Uh, and you can then get that, collect that data with the micro bit and then store it in a spreadsheet uh, and uh, create something that uh, actually applies to the real world uh, using, using your micro bit that maybe you already have in your classrooms. Uh, so that's one thing you can do. You can also do that with more complicated devices like Arduinos and things like that too. Uh, acquiring data is the other part of, of the curriculum. And so uh, you'll find that there are a lot of websites out there for, for data and they'll often be quite complex. Uh, they'll have data uh, that's not necessarily clean or easy for students to use. But here are some examples of different kinds of data sets that have been designed specifically for school students. So we're gonna take a quick look at the, the CSIRO educational data sets. Uh, and so you can see here, they have a page with a bunch of things on. And I think my personal favorite out of all of these is the Western Australian wheat belt bird survey. Um, so shout out to anyone who's in Western Australia. Uh, and we just, they have teacher guides about the the data and things like that. We're just going to download the data for the moment so we can take a look at what exactly it is. Um, so you open it up. It's a folder full of information. It's a CSV, um, which is just a comma separated value uh, spreadsheet. And so you can open that up and it means you've got something that's basically a simple table. Uh, and we can see we've got, you know, on the left side, a bunch of birds and on the right side, a number of months. This is a sort of um, data that you can then take into your data interpretation sides of your class uh, and do some nice graphs and sorting of data and answering of different questions. Uh, like a really simple question is how many yellow billed spoon bills were found? And you know, we can see here, it looks like there were five of them uh, over that year. Um, and there are different levels of, of that data set for different year levels. Uh, so 
it's a real, uh, real nice uh, resource for for acquiring data in uh, in those school years. Um, did you want to talk about a couple of the other resources there, Dan? Um, yeah, and uh, there was a question in chat about a copy of the data sources. Um, so we'll make the slides available um, after the webinar. Um, they'll be in the description of the video. So um, all the links um, in the slides will um, get you to these different uh, data sources. Yeah. Um, and then basically, like for the CSRO ones that uh, Kenny just showed, pretty much just go through and um, uh, it's possible to download them. Yeah, through you also the want to link into the Zoom chat now, um, like after you've talked about this slide? Yeah, for sure. Um, we can put them in um, the chat as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, can you mention the CSIRO educational uh, data sets? Um, some of the, well, most of that was done by um, uh, Linda McIver from the Australian uh, Data Science Education Institute. Um, so, they are working on um, a whole bunch of resources too for uh, teaching data science in K-12 because um, something you may have experienced when teaching uh, sort of data science projects is you find um, data um, but it might be a bit messy or a bit hard to understand for the students um, but what um, uh, these sources do is provide um, simpler data sets that are a bit more straightforward for uh, students. So there's the Australian Data Science Education Institute and there's also a link there to um, a website called uh, Corgis, where someone has set up a, um, uh, Austin Bart, I believe his name is, um, has set up um, basically a, a bunch of data sets um, around interesting sort of topics, um, power usage, um, crime statistics, and so on. Um, a lot of them are aimed or sort of being collected from the US, so they're quite US centric, um, but they might be worth a look for, you know, ideas for um, data that you could use with your own students um, as well. So I think that's it. I'll, I will um, link those in the chat now as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, so acquiring data um, is quite a good thing for students to learn about. Um, it gets them to think about uh, different types of data and you can get cool interesting things that they wouldn't have been able to do themselves, like surveying birds over 12 months. Uh, all right. So now we're going to have a bit of a discussion about the different types of data there are. So obviously there are two big categories here, which is quantitative and qualitative. Uh, they're a bit of a mouthful, um, but they're a good thing to learn. Um, so the quantitative stuff is the stuff that we can like, uh, that is you know, countable or uh, finite in, in, in what it is. So categorical, um, you know, you have a finite number of categories and you can compare them and you can say this thing is in this category or this category. Numerical, obviously numbers, so things like height uh, and uh, you know uh, weight and age, numbers that you can compare to each other, uh, and relational data, which is something that comes up in the later years, which is, uh, for instance, uh, if you're uh, talking about um, you know movie data about actors and which movies they're in, that's relational data because uh, you know you can't just make up the name of a random movie there has to be a movie that exists and you obviously want it to be a movie that exists in your database if you're talking about making a movie review website or something like that. Uh, so those are all examples of quantitative data. Uh, and we've got qualitative data, so unstructured text. So in that movie example, it would be like, uh, you know, the text that describes the plot of the movie. It's unstructured text. Uh, you can't really compare those things to each other. Uh, and pictorial, so like a movie poster. Maybe it has information on it, but it doesn't, you can't really compare the information on it unless you extract it into a quantitative data form. Um, so hopefully you're all familiar with that, but if you're not, that's fine because we're gonna do a little quiz. Uh, so if you know how to use Zoom annotations, uh, that's great because that's what we're gonna be doing. Um, what you have to do is uh, jump to the view options at the, at the top of your Zoom window and go down to annotate. And if you can get the stamp tool, that's probably the best thing to use um, for the next activity that we're doing. Uh, and have a go at stamping on the page here so that I know that some of you have got it before we move on to the next slide. Yep, we've got a bunch of stamps appearing. Excellent. Uh, I'll give you a couple more seconds to figure it out. Question mark. Great. Uh, 
I'm going to clear you all away so it doesn't get too confusing. All right, so I'm going to go on to the next slide here. All right, so we've got a bunch of qualitative and quantitative uh, types of data. So what I'd like you to do is put a stamp in the one that you think is correct. So do you think a movie rating is quantitative or qualitative? A textual movie review, genre of music, the time of day a photo was taken, a list of social media users' friends, photo of a meal. All right, looks like everybody's uh, pretty much in the same uh, state of mind for all of these things. Uh, but feel free to, to, to put a stamp in the other side if you think everyone else is wrong. Stand out from the crowd. All right. Got a lot of answers there. We've got qualitative for a genre of music, which is good. I like someone making a, a different argument. All right, we're gonna move on to the next slide where we have answers now. All right, I thought we were gonna do that. Now we're gonna do that. All right, so you can see those green ticks kind of in the background where someone's nailed it with their hearts for all of them in the center of the screen. Uh, so we said a movie rating was quantitative because you know generally it's um, either a thumbs up and a thumbs down or like out of five stars. It's something that you can compare to each other. There's a finite number of results there. Um, a textual movie review is obviously if it's loose text and you can type whatever you want. You can't necessarily compare those. Uh, you can't strictly compare those all to each other. Now, genre of music I think is an interesting one because. Uh, if it's categorical information, there's a finite number of categories, but it's a, a bit tricky, right? Because a genre of music is subjective. Uh, and even if you say that the data is quantitative, you know, you can say something's two genres or you can make up new genres all the time. So I think whoever put that tick in qualitative, uh, you know, that's a, that's a good call because sometimes it can be just unstructured text is, is what the genre of music is. But often if you, have a music service like Spotify or whatever, they'll probably use a quantitative one so that they can sort and filter things. Uh, the time of day a photo was taken is obviously a number, even though you know, it's a tricky one because uh, it has a photo in there and photos are often uh, things that are qualitative or essentially are qualitative, uh, but we're talking about the time of day. Uh, list of social media users' friends, that's obviously relational data because uh, you don't want to have a friend who doesn't exist on the service that that would be a bit too confusing wouldn't be helpful for the programmers who are making that website so it's relational data and a photo of a meal qualitative but there is quantitative information in there like you could count the number of uh, peas in their meal although most people probably aren't taking photos of peas so you'd have to wonder how useful that was uh, all right so we'll move on to our next slide uh, you all did very well you passed my quiz uh, all right, our next slide is about uh, data validated. So we did our poll earlier uh, and we can see that we've got a bunch of responses. Uh, we've got 18 responses here. I'm gonna open those responses in Excel so that we can take a look at them uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, let me... Did I download it? No, open Excel. We're opening this in Excel. Great. All right. Now, if we open this in Excel, we should get a list of responses. Uh, and what we've got here is a bunch of different responses. Now, what I'm going to get you to do is to use your stamp tool to see if you can find any responses that to you seem uh, like they might be invalid data. Um, so here we've got, what is your name? Someone putting a stamp on uh, a bunch of what seems to be binary. Uh, yep, some of this entire row seems to be full of interesting responses. Here we've got, how many years have you been teaching for? 4,000. Yeah, that seems a, a bit suspicious to me. Um, yep, some people, putting hearts on fake news schools and school of hard knocks. Fake public school, someone put a star on. 
great. So you'll notice that there's, there seems to be a trend in which particular uh, fields happen to have invalid data uh, because in some of those, it, uh, you weren't allowed to enter in uh, invalid data. Of course, uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion about what exactly it means for data to be invalid. Um, all right, so uh, can you just clear that screen, Dan? I've lost my annotation somewhere. Oh, now I've got it. Here we go. Oh, we're all right. good. Yep, we're good. All right, so here's a list of uh, types of invalid data. Um, so one is empty or missing data, uh, which I don't think we actually had uh, any visible on the screen there. Um, let's see. Um, but you, because you couldn't see it, um, you didn't mention it, but we could see that there are some people who didn't say what their favorite part of digital technologies was, which, you know, I suppose you're allowed to not have a favorite, but uh, in certain circumstances, you might have empty or missing data that is important for you to have, and you can't answer certain questions because of it. Uh, values of the wrong kind. So for instance, uh, we had which type of school did you go to? And we had a bunch of binary data in there, um, which is really hard to then compare to um, other people and other schools. Like if you wanted to get information about the schools that the teachers in this webinar attended, you wouldn't be able to get it because it's of the wrong kind. And you wouldn't be able to compare it to the other values. Uh, values out of range. So for instance, that 4,000 years teaching seems a little bit out of range. Uh, if that was a negative number, it would be even more confusing because how do you teach for negative years? I don't know. Uh, factually incorrect values. So obviously 4,000 was another example of a factually incorrect value. Uh, but we had a question that was about um, teaching primary, secondary, or both. Uh, and that's really hard to tell whether someone put the factually correct value in there. You kind of just have to, like, you can't have a value out of range because we didn't give you the option. But it's kind of hard to tell whether it's factually correct. Uh, so, you know, data validation is really tricky when it gets to some of these things. Uh, the other thing is uncertain or ambiguous values. Uh, so, for instance, we had which type of school do you teach at? And I gave some examples of types, but like the example of genres of music, it's actually not clear uh, what types of school actually exist because, you know, I gave a, an ambiguous set of different things. Uh, and one of the interesting uh, examples we had there was someone said JTU student as the type of school. And we said, we had someone who, who said online and in person and also through PDFs sometimes. Uh, which I assume is someone who's working at the ACA uh, and they're describing how they, how they teach. Uh, so, you know, uh, there are all these different kinds of types of invalid data and uh, some of them are easier and some of them are harder to recognize. Um, and so you should keep that in mind when you're teaching your students about validating data, uh, getting them to talk about the, uh, the level of validation should be relevant to, to which year level they're at. So, you know, simpler kinds, for your younger students and getting some of the more subtle ones for your older students. Uh, all right. The other thing we should talk about is privacy and security. So this is only introduced in year nine and 10 in the curriculum, but you know, you're welcome to bring it up a bit in the earlier years as well, if you'd like. Um, you should talk about the privacy and security requirements um, for the solutions that students make. So you know, if they're making a survey, they should inform the people doing the survey where those results are going to exist. So you'll notice in the form we uh, said that your name was going to appear in the webinar. Uh, so you have to be comfortable with that in your school as well. Um, so you should make sure that personally, personal, personally identifiable information in surveys is not publicly shared as an example. And there are other security, security and privacy concerns. Um, we've got an ACA course about um, the security of uh, web applications and how you make sure that information that uh, shouldn't be available to people isn't available. Uh, and so it gives students an, an idea of what professionals and things, uh, when they're creating uh, solutions for people to use, what they have to watch out for and make sure uh, to protect when they're creating solutions. So that's the web security cyber course um, that, that we created for our cyber security challenges. Uh, 
Storage is the other part of data collection and storing data is obviously helpful for answering questions later on. We looked at an example of an Excel spreadsheet and it's nice and it makes things nice and easy because we can look at things in a, in a big table and we can do sorting and things and we'll, we'll talk about um, how we can answer questions using Excel a bit later on in the webinar. Um, you can store things in CSVs, which we saw earlier with the, the, the list of bird counts. Uh, but you can store relational data in SQL tables and one of the teachers earlier said they use uh, Microsoft Access. Um, someone says, what's the difference between a CSV and Excel? That's a good question. Uh, so I would say a CSV is a subset of uh, Excel. So Excel, you can put values all over the place. So you can have formulas and things that, like that. But a CSV is strictly a table of data. It's got columns and rows, where in Excel, things can be re rearranged all equally if you want. Um, and so it's important uh, if you want the data to be um, uh, to be a bit less complicated to use CSVs. So a lot of programmers like it because uh, there's a lot less uh, complications in, involved in it. And there's a good example of um, how this goes uh, by its people uh, in the real world. Uh, there was recently a gene um, that genetic researchers had to rename because when you entered it in Excel, uh, as opposed to a CSV, it would transform the gene's name into a date. Uh, so that's an example of how data representation can go a little wrong when your tools are a little bit uh, too smart for their own good. Um, yeah, so uh, you should be using tools that are appropriate for the year levels of students, obviously, uh, but uh, you know, not storing things in a Word document or in an image is a good uh, lesson for kids to learn because it can be hard to get information uh, from that kind of data. Um, and you'll find bad examples of this all over the place um, when you try to look up data um, and it's stuck in a bunch of PDFs or in an image. All right. Um, so now I'm going to summarize a bit about what um, data collection uh, is. But before that, I'm going to get you to uh, get your annotations again. So if you missed how to do that, that's in your view options and annotate. Uh, and I'm going to get you to stamp on this next slide, uh, which of these things that you think you're uh, already doing in your classroom. And you can put a little X if you don't, don't think you, you've managed to do it yet. So we've got uh, gather data by counting and, and measuring in the earlier years. Um, so that's like the example of going out and counting cars or, um, you know, counting the number of uh, different kinds of balls you have in your sports equipment. Uh, now, years three, four, obtaining data from an online data source. Obviously, they're doing some of the stuff in year uh, that they did in uh, up to year two before that. So they're also counting and measuring in those early years, but they should also learn how to obtain data from an online data source. Uh, year five, six, we're developing uh, their own questions to be answered. So, you know, thinking about what questions they want to be answered and then doing a survey or collecting data using uh, sensors from a, a micro bit or something like that uh, and recording the data to be accessed and manipulated. So, you know, not just writing it down on a sheet of paper, but also putting it into some sort of software where they can manipulate it. Uh, and in five and six, we start talking about managing data. So ensuring the data is correct and meaningful. So it's doing some um, validation uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be all the different kinds of validation, but you know, thinking a bit more about uh, how we can make sure that the data is correct for the questions that they're asking. Uh, years seven and eight, they're talking about storing data in appropriate software, such as databases. Um, so the, the, if you go to the curriculum website on the ACA, it gives you the example of using SQL databases or things like that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. So, you know, if you're not teaching SQL in your classroom, don't worry, it's okay. Um, but, you know, you should be storing more complex data and uh, thinking about how in those next years you can talk about relational data and things. Uh, and they should be ensuring data validity in more subtle situations. So uh, thinking about things like the range of data and, making sure when you do a survey question, not letting people answer in ways that will be incorrect and confusing. Uh, year nine and 10, we're talking about developing systems that store structured data. Uh, so uh, 
you know, having a bit more structured data, relational things, and, you know, you might have lists of things uh, inside of that data. So getting a bit more complex in terms of the types of data that you store. Uh, they should also take into account privacy and security requirements. Great. Uh, so now that we've talked about data collection, we're going to move on and talk about data interpretation. Oh, no, wait, no, before we get to that, we're going to be talking about uh, data modeling, uh, which uh, inside of the curriculum is under uh, data, uh, it's under data interpretation, but I would say probably the best way to think about it is about uh, a form of data representation. Uh, and when we're talking about data representation, it's important to talk about abstraction, uh, which involves hiding details and uh, putting things into a manageable number of aspects. So in earlier years, you want things to be more abstract, later years, less abstract and have more detail. So here, data modeling, process of creating abstract representations using data, it's a tricky skill to get right. Um, even programmers and software professionals don't necessarily get it right. Uh, and we like in many different jobs we're using data and it can be quite hard to to know how to get things right um i had a friend who was talking about how they had uh, people at their work putting notes inside of the email field of their um, their customer relations software uh, and it, it turned out that was not very helpful for when they wanted to email someone uh, so here's some examples of what data modeling looks like through the years. So in those earlier years, you have tallies, the later years, you start using tables. Uh, and in the real late years, in uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, you, mo you start modeling objects, events, and relations. So uh, in this example, we have a class ID, and you can see that kind of links together the, um, the class to, uh, to the information about the, the different classes. So you can tell using uh, those two tables that Sajatha has Miss Thomas as a teacher and James also has Miss Thomas as a teacher. And you don't have to repeat the information throughout all the role, rows of the table. Uh, so, you know, in those later years, you can represent both of those sets of information in a single table. Uh, but in the later years, we're talking about uh, what is called in university normalizing data. Uh, all right. Uh, another quick example, um, we're talking about numbers and text in those early years uh, and in the middle years you have lists of things uh, and the later years we're talking about objects, so more complex representations with structured data. So here we've got an example of something called JavaScript object notation or JSON. If you ever try and buy a data online, you might find this data format um, around. Uh, and it basically has keys and values. So basically labels and then values for those labels and you can have lists of um, values. So a class, for instance, has multiple students. Uh, all right, now we're gonna talk about data interpretation. So um, as I mentioned before, data interpretation is really when we start um, extracting meaning from data. So uh, that includes when we're um, using statistical analysis, maybe we're summarizing the data in some way, um, but also when we're uh, doing some visualization. Uh, so uh, data interpretation, um, the way that the unpacking uh, resource uh, separates it is into organizing data and visualizing data. So when we talk about um, organizing data, we're talking about um, so for example, is there where we're doing maybe some filtering, where we're filtering out data or uh, grouping common data together to answer uh, certain questions. Um, and it can involve things like summary statistics, like calculating averages and so on. And also looking at uh, when or making predictions based on the data that we have. Um, so for example, looking at trends or uh, identifying outliers in our data. Um, so there's examples there of um, uh, different questions um, and one of the um, questions that we've gotten before is is thinking about examples of what this means uh, in the earlier years so um, you know maybe this is in here we're sort of looking I guess from foundation to um, years three and four uh, potentially um, what ways can you teach organizing data and so in the early years things like 
um, getting photos of different pets and sorting them into different um, types of animals as an example of organizing data. Um, getting all your classmates together and um, sorting everyone by height from uh, tallest to shortest um, is organizing data. So those are a couple of examples there. Um, so what we'll do, um, what Kenny is going to do is show how organizing data can help answer some questions. So, um, you know, if we look at the average number of um, years teaching DT, um, as a way of doing that in Excel, um, if you're um, not familiar with it, is you can use the average uh, formula and uh, basically look at uh, all of the numbers in the, that particular range and that will calculate um, the average value. Um, have I done mine here? I think let's get rid of invalid data. No, wait. Can I look at the formula? Or I think I've got the... Oh, you're looking for the average of the uh, idle for some reason and not the range. What is it? K2. Divide by zero. Mm. We don't know. Because you have a blank so. cell in there, possibly. There's a blank cell in uh, one of the rows. Sorry? Uh, is it because of the blank cell in uh, uh, Yeah, possibly? Oh, I think it's because they're not numbers. Oh, okay, right. They've, it's interpreted them as text. Yep. So this is the other thing you have to do is... A bit of cleaning. A bit of data cleaning and validation. Uh, so number, okay. Did that change it? No. Number, yes. Mm, I don't think those are numbers. Well, you can see the complications of, of doing this actually. <laughs> um, yep, so that's how you find the average. Uh, which teachers teach both primary and secondary? Uh, so we can go over to the to the column with uh, primary and secondary. Click on the drop down. You can look at the ones that just teach both. Um, so we can see that we've got six teachers there that teach both. Um, there was a question in chat about um, teaching SQL that isn't access. Um, so, and an example um, using SQL Lite and looking at a program like DB Browser. Um, is there a reason uh, that access doesn't work or is it just that I'm just looking for a different alternative? Uh, it's just that the kids keep switching from the wizard where it does everything for you to the SQL language one. So you can't tell whether they're doing it in SQL or whether they're doing it in wizard. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, suppose, um, I, I would say that maybe the point isn't necessarily to to make them learn SQL. It's to to get them to learn uh, data uh, data collection and data collection tools. And if they're using a wizard and that's more useful, then I wouldn't necessarily be disappointed in that. Um, but if you do really want them to learn SQL because they need it for later or projects and things, um, I would say Grok Learning has a as a course on SQL where the data is in in the web browser and they can only access it by using SQL and there's, you know, it quizzes them on it basically. And, you know, short of them recreating the database inside of um, their own computer and replicating all the queries and things, which, you know, would be an impressive effort in itself. Um, they actually have to then write to SQL. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how you uh, convince them not to, to cheat in that way. Um, um, so we're going to look at a few examples of visualization. So I mentioned organized data is one of the, sort of the, the main aspects of data interpretation, um, but visualizing data is also um, important as well. 
And so, um, you know, as you know, if you've seen infographics and that sort of thing, um, visualization can, can really help us um, communicate information um, clearly um, and perhaps um, in easier to follow ways than, you know, in a spreadsheet or so on. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's a couple of examples here. Um, so, uh, someone asked before about, you know, data collection uh, software for sort of the early years and, and different um, ways of doing that. Um, potentially, what you can do is, um, if you did your data collection, say, with, I don't know, taking tallies or just counting and um, doing that by hand, um, potentially what you could do is then use um, software for the visualization um, part of it. Um, so there's a, a link here to a, a paper where um, basically the researchers went and looked at uh, common ways that students visualize data. Um, and so there's ones in here that I really like, like the idea of like the, the table with the different um, uh, ingredients, like the different salad ingredients. Um, it's quite a simple visualization and something that you could probably make in Word or something like that. Um, but it just makes it a bit um, easier to interpret and shows the sort of the advantages of visualization. Um, so those are the ones, those are some good examples for sort of the expectations around um, foundation to four. Um, there's a couple of examples here to once you get to five to six, there's that expectation that um, students look at sort of more complex uh, graphs and, and visualizations. Um, and so in the unpacking, um, the ACA give the example of a wagon wheel. Um, which you might have seen if you uh, watch the cricket, um, you know, which show uh, the patterns in um, in the in the batting, and um, you know something like that is a good example of a visualization um, that students around that five or six um, band level um, should be able to follow. Another example is a, a scatter plot, so looking at graphs, um, not sort of just bar charts, but looking at sort of more um, complicated graphs. Um, and then there's, there's an example here of a, um, a scatter plot looking at um, height across uh, footprint. And, and, and so they've done a, um, a, a, um, a line best fit, fit through that as well. Um, so seven to eight, um, there's a couple of examples here. And what I would um, recommend in that um, CSRO educational data sets companion um, that we sent through earlier. Um, oh, sorry, the Educational Data Sets um, website. There's a companion guide um, which goes through a whole bunch of um, common types of visualizations, um, gives examples of them. Um, and so in, in these two examples, there's a sort of a more complex uh, bar chart with um, more categories um, on the right there. And then on the left, there's a, a line chart that shows a trend. So when you're getting into that, seven to 10 and um, you know you start looking at trends and um, uh, I guess different sets of data and contrasting them like is done on the left there. Um, and another, um, another uh, type of chart that's mentioned in the curriculum uh, in the unpacking is the, you know, the idea of multi-dimensional um, charts. So once you start um, looking at these, things like scatter plots where you have um, uh, bubbles with um, size, like different sizes. So um, on the right there, um, it's a, a, a chart with uh, population versus uh, land, uh, land mass. And the size of the bubble is the, um, the GDP. So, um, you know, you've got those different dimensions. It's not just the um, the two variables, you've got uh, something else in, in there as well. And similarly, um, looking at map charts, and um, I, I've noticed um, I was trying, uh, you know, Google Sheets and um, Microsoft Excel recently to see what they can do with map charts. Um, and some of the features, um, with those are really good um, in terms of what you can do. And um, yeah, so, and I guess the thing just to, to note with that Australia one was it was looking at um, the median age in those regions and, and it's um, the more red it is, the higher the median age um, in that region. Um, and yeah, so there's uh, just in, just to, um, on that point in chat, so there's a, um, a companion for each like data set, which, and I think it's a teacher guide, 
but then there's a um, there's also like a, a general data set companion, um, which I can link in the chat as well. Um, another thing too is um, in the nine and ten band, um, the yeah. idea of interactive uh, visualizations, and it would be interesting to know um, if you've had experience with teaching with these um, sort of tools. So where students can play with data and create sort of interactive visualizations where there's things like um, sliders um, where you can add different data sets here. So on the left here, there's um, a whole bunch of different data sets through the Google public data system. Students can go through, they can add um, additional data sets. Um, there's a slider down the bottom where you can slide through um, the year um, of that data. So you can actually see that, um, that data through time, which is quite cool. Um, and I've included the Google public data, which is what's in that screenshot there. There's also the um, Australian government's uh, national map, uh, which allows you to sort of overlay uh, data on top of a map of Australia. And, um, and Gapminder, um, which is the, uh, it's an interesting uh, website, it's worth checking out. Um, basically provides a bunch of visualizations to help you see the, um, uh, I guess, inequalities in different um, countries, um, looking at a whole bunch of different data there, um, and that's worth a look as well. And I've just noted that, uh, thank you, Damien, you put a, a link in. So I think that's like, there's a, a guide um, that those, those two charts um, have come from. So, We've included those resources there. Um, we've mentioned all of those. Uh, Stephen Few is an author who's written a few different books about data visualization. Um, his stuff is sort of um, more targeted towards uh, professionals in the sense of like, it's more like people working in the industry and um, that and how they use visualization. But um, what he's good for is he has some interesting um, sort of sharing of his sort of guidelines and best practices for visualization. Um, and he's written a lot of, he's very prolific in, in terms of um, the books that he's written and, and articles that he's written about data visualization. So um, what we'll do now, um, we're almost at the end, um, but what we'll do now is a similar to what we just did with the uh, data collection where we look at the different um, expectations at the different uh, band levels and you put in your um, ticks and crosses to sort of say, okay, yep, I'm covering this already in my classroom or, um, you know, I'm not quite there yet um, with, a, with a cross. So, um, so when we talk about organizing data, when we're looking at um, the F to two, um, we're talking about organizing data, it's about, you know, um, doing some sorting, like the example of, of sorting students by height, um, you know, maybe doing some tallies and visualizing it that way with uh, tables and pictographs. Um, in uh, years three and four, looking at um, answering different questions, something like, I don't know, who is the tallest uh, student in the class? Um, and then looking at some uh, simple charts. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, so no worries. Um, uh, and, you know, when, we, when we're looking at um, five and six, um, answering some questions. So for example, um, there was the scatter plot with uh, uh, foot size and um, height before, sort of saying, okay, is there some relationship between these two things? Is it likely that if I'm taller, then I'll have a, a larger foot size and so on? Um, and so the example there in visualizing is, you know, using a scatter plot and seeing trends. Um, once we get to years um, seven and eight, um, summarizing data, so things like calculating um, the average, um, the range, um, and so on, um, and then doing some multi-dimensional charting. So the example before of, um, you know, using uh, color and size in a scatter plot to indicate some other um, the value of some other variable. Um, and then once we get to uh, year 9 and 10, looking at ways of identifying trends and outliers in data. 
Um, and uh, so Kenny gave some examples of you know, relationships between um, different uh, entities like the, the student and the teacher um, and identifying how to, to model those. Um, and then interactive uh, visualizations for the visualization section. So um, getting students to build um, use tools like uh, you know, Google Public Data or GapMinder to, to build those interactive visualizations. Um, and uh, Ellie just shared an example, um, ACT Gov Open Data Site. So um, it sounds like that's quite similar to the uh, map uh, chart, but maybe specific to ACT, but that sounds um, really interesting. So I guess, for example, you could get students to look at, um, uh, you know, where, where are the common areas that there's bike accidents and then, um, do a bit of investigation to figure out, okay, well, why are they happening there? Um, and that could be an, an interesting project. Um, and also, uh, Ellie has mentioned there, uh, the Digital Technologies Hub um, has some uh, resources there for uh, data sets. So that's good to know. Um, so looking at the uh, table, it looks like um, a lot of people sort of covering the stuff um, towards seven to eight. And that might just be a reflection of um, the levels that people are teaching at, um, but that's um, very interesting. So, um, what's next, Kenny? <laughs> uh, next is a summary. We've got to the end. Um, so we talked about data collection versus data interpretation, uh, what the relevant outcomes are for each different year level, uh, and hopefully uh, you're either all uh, doing those things already or you've learned a little bit more uh, or come up with some new interesting ideas uh, from the resources that we've recommended uh, and from the resources that other teachers have recommended here, which is great. Uh, and uh, hopefully some of the little interactive activities um, we did taught you a little bit more about data collection and interpretation and how you can teach them in your classroom. Um, if you've got any questions, you're welcome to stay and we'll be here for the next few minutes. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, hope you learned a lot. Uh, and remember, next week we've got the uh, webinar on integration and uh, how you can integrate subjects in primary school and how you can uh, reference other subjects in when you're in high school and um, you know, uh, work on some collaborative and interesting uh, uh, interesting things that you can do uh, with digital technologies uh, and other subjects. So something to, to mention there is um, that there's two separate um, webinars next week. There's one for specifically for integrating in primary and one specifically for integrating in secondary. So I'll just paste them in the chat um, if you'd like to know more. And thank you everyone. Have a good afternoon. Yeah.